from the 1980s to the 1990s, the drug epidemic cost millions of lives and billions of dollars. The use of crack cocaine exploded on the streets of South Central Los Angeles, increasing violence and crime all over the city. The incarceration rate increased as the homicide rate grew exponentially. The decade of dreams actually began over 40 years ago with Pastor Tommy Barnett to reach the lost and broken of Los Angeles. This dream flowed over into a young man named Matthew Barnett. It's not about us, it's about helping others while you're hurt. Who wanted to love and serve people who were hurting. Jesus was the example of this. Whenever the pain was strongest in Jesus' life, he served the most. Matthew noticed the old, vacant Queen of Angels Hospital in Echo Park, and he saw his father's dream could become a reality. This was only the beginning. Welcome to the Dream Center. Hello, I'm Pastor Matthew Barnett, and thank you for joining us today. Here at the Dream Center, we see a lot of hurting and broken people. Since 1994, when my father Tommy Barnett and I launched the Dream Center, our mission has always been to reconnect isolated people to God and a community of support by providing basic services that address immediate and long-term needs in areas of homelessness, poverty, addiction, and abuse. When I walk the Dream Center campus, I see all the people that God has brought here to go through the recovery programs and stayed to serve in our ministries and give back. It's truly incredible to see once a person has gone through the program, instead of serving their own addiction, they now start to serve others and to see them make a full recovery. But more than that, they find Jesus. The Dream Center offers free programs and resources for men, women, and children who are in need of a second chance. We believe that the story that you're about to watch will inspire you to make an impact in someone else's life. And we hope that you consider partnering with the Dream Center so that we can continue to make a difference. At any given time, we have over 700 residents from all walks of life living here at the Dream Center. It doesn't matter where they've come from, how much money we've made, or how successful we've been, when life's toughest challenges come our way, we can easily find ourselves in hopeless situations. Let me introduce you to a man named Curtis. Curtis grew up in a dysfunctional home with parents addicted to alcohol and unable to invest in their son because they were working multiple jobs to make ends meet. Without a strong foundation and with nowhere to turn, a tragedy happens in his family and Curtis, like so many young men and women, turned to drugs and alcohol to numb his pain. Now here is Curtis' story. My name is Curtis Van Fossen. I'm 24 years old from Orange County, California. I didn't grow up in a, a church-going family. My parents were both alcoholics. Seeing that definitely uh, made me not want to do it because I saw the dysfunction that it came with. But being in the, in the skateboarding scene as I got older, uh, that introduced me to smoking weed. We didn't have much money as we were growing up, me and my family. Uh, my parents always had multiple jobs. I was like 17, I got a job at, a, at the bowling alley. I started making my own money, being able to provide for myself. I was starting to get things like going in my life, but that enabled me to be able to buy as much weed as I wanted. My parents couldn't afford to provide a home for us anymore. So we ended up moving in with my grandmother and she loved me. She like, she really cared about me and I wasn't really used to that. So she did that for, for two years while we were living there. And then she got diagnosed with lung cancer. When I first heard about it, I'm like, it's no big deal. Like she, she's gonna live forever. Like she's super strong. She doesn't drink. She doesn't do any type of drugs. Six, eight months go by and I saw her literally like deteriorate and it was like 
really hard for me to see that. I believed that there was a God, but I didn't have a relationship with him. To like see these things happen to my grandma, I don't, I don't understand at that time how God is good when, when all I'm seeing is death in front of me. You know, like the, the one woman that, that truly like spoke into my life and cared for me and loved me deeply, how could God want to like take that away from me? Like I needed her at that moment. to die she was on hospice and we um i got called in the room like this is going to be the last time that you're going to be able to speak with her and she told me she's like i'm so proud of you and and i love you so much and i'm always going to be proud of you and i know you're going to do great things and you're going to help so many people because she always told me like you have such a good heart she, she always like saw my heart and things like I, i've always wanted to like help people She passed away a couple days later, and after that, it was just, it was a downward spiral. I, I didn't want to deal with it at that time. I just, I suppressed it with smoking weed, and some medication that she had left was uh, some Vicodin extra strength. In that, I developed a, a pill-taking habit now. I was tired, I was, I was weary, I didn't know how to deal with it, and I didn't have God because I didn't, I didn't ask for him. I was mad at him. I was like, why would you, why would you do this to me? At about like 18, 19 years old, I, I started going to trade school to become a medical assistant. And then I came across a drug called Xanax, which completely changed my life because it gave me, once I took one of those, like all my worries were gone. I didn't, I didn't have to feel anything. I graduated from that trade school. I ended up getting placed at a job over in Garden Grove, and I was making pretty good money. From the outside in, like the world is saying, like, man, this this dude's got it together. You know, he's got he's got a nice car, he's got money. But inside, I was just I felt like I was dying. When I was making more money, I have the opportunity now to buy more drugs and sell drugs also. Go sell pills to people, and I would take them. And I started drinking and driving and just totally being reckless. And uh, I got. Uh, for my first DUI over in Seal Beach, California, and I was stopped, I was parked, didn't even have my car on or anything, but a cop came up and knocked on the window, like, uh, you all right, dude? And I was like, yeah, dude, I'm just tired. And uh, he's like, okay, well, we need to run some tests on you. And I passed all the field sobriety tests, I can walk a straight line and all that. And, uh, and then he gets to the breathalyzer and I blew a .02, which is like, I was 20 years old, so it, I couldn't have anything in my system. So once he found that out, he's like, all right, well, I need to take you in. I was on like a really short leash with my job. So uh, once I missed and I no call, no showed, they fired me. So I got out of jail and they were like, uh, they were like, yeah, you can come in tomorrow and collect your last check. Right when I got the money from that check, I. I picked up like 200 Xanax and I started just selling them and taking them and I didn't have a job then so I was just doing whatever I wanted. So I, I chose methamphetamine, I picked up $20 worth and next thing I know like I took a line of it and I was addicted. I was like, okay, this is what I was missing. I went out to a party over in Compton and I showed up and I drank a lot and I took more pills. So I had a car full of people. They were gonna come over to my house. And then I get on the freeway, somebody cuts me off and I just jerk the wheel, just going around in circles. I, I hit an ambulance. I was a mess. I thought people died and everything. And uh, they took me to the hospital and I, I told them like, man, I, I just really wanna kill myself. Like, I don't, I don't know what the point is. What's the point of me being here? It's. Like, I'm, I'm tired of being depressed. I'm tired of everything. I'm just tired of life. Like, I don't want to live anymore. Finally, I was just like, you know what? All right, like, I need help. My mom has been, had been telling me for like the last four years, you can come to my house. She took me in, she introduced me to people at the church, some people that were in a discipleship program at the church called Veritas. They wanted to hang out with me. They wanted to just be around me. They knew my situation and I didn't understand. Like, I was like, dude, I'm a mess right now. How could you just love me? 
first night we were at the church, I went in there and I was just broken. I, I had nothing left. Like I, I told God, like, look, either you're gonna speak to me right now or like I'm done. And once I asked for his help, he just spoke to me and said, I'm always with you. And I just started bawling. Like, <laughs> that's exactly what I needed to hear at that moment. Like he, he just came through with comfort. Like literally so loud too that I like looked around. I'm like, did you hear that? <laughs> that was the first time God spoke to me. And just an overwhelming sense of like his presence and comfort came across me. And right then I was, I was never the same. And then I decided to get baptized. But the, the spark to want to use again came up. Right before I went to go get baptized, I, I relapsed. Well, I told part of my testimony to the people, and I was high. He baptized me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I went into the water, and when I came out, I wasn't high anymore. He's like, nope, this isn't my plan for your life. Some people that were from the Dream Center Leadership School program, they had told my family about the discipleship program here. They're like, it's free, you can come get away from all the worries of the world for the year. There was a reason that God put that in my life. I need to go after it. So right once I got in there, I was like, I'm gonna read my Bible, I'm gonna do everything to the best of my ability, and I'm just gonna see what God can do. I figured out who Jesus was. I figured out like what, what he was about and I figured out that he was about me. He's about the outcasts. He's, he's about the, the lepers. He's about people that are just broken. And he's about just raising them up. He's the healer, he's the comforter. Like he's, he's down for me. Once I figured that out, it was, it was all uphill from there. I'm like, I'm going after this dude full force. Like I need to, I need to figure out everything that he's about. I wanna be just like him. I had made a lot of bad decisions. I kept my parents up at night, you know, like that. And he just instantly like reunited us and made us a family again. I get to watch little kids. I get to see them grow in God and I get to speak into their lives. And I just think it's crazy that, that God could take a whole family of addicts and just completely transform their lives and make them just stay focused on him like totally just put everything behind us. Like that's what his forgiveness does. It literally, he wipes the slate clean and he's like, okay, now grow into, into what I called you to be. I, I can't even fathom like the kind of love that that takes. Like I used to be a complete mess. I used to be broken. I used to be suicidal. I used to not want to live. And now, I have life, I love my life. Just to see that huge transformation, like <laughs> I, it's only God that can make that stuff happen. That's, that's only God. As a child, Curtis learned early on that parents are fallible people, imperfect just like everyone else. When he got a little older, he vowed not to rely on alcohol like they did, but instead he turned to drugs to help him deal with life. So often we try so hard to mask our pain with something else. Maybe not drugs or alcohol, but relationships, work, money, food, the list goes on and on. But the truth is none of these things last. They're a band-aid, a quick fix. God is the solution. He is what we need. He can take us from a place of brokenness and addiction, a place of pain from the loss of a loved one to complete wholeness. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse four, it says, trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. In Philippians chapter four and verse six and seven, one of my favorite verses says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer, petition, thanksgiving, presenting your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Curtis was looking for escape and he found it in drugs and alcohol. But when those things began to take over, striking fear into him, he needed a place of help. And God knew exactly the plan he had in mind for Curtis. God knew Curtis' passion for skateboarding, and he turned it into something impactful. 
Now Curtis wants to bring light to the skateboarder world. He's building relationships and helping young kids, not much different than himself, to turn to Jesus. Will you join us today in helping young men like Curtis who have let drugs and alcohol take over their lives to have a new chance? Will you help them be the change? We can't do without you. By supporting the Dream Center, you are providing shelter, counseling, mentoring, education, and above all, Jesus to so many in need. This is the way we will fight the epidemic of addiction. Please join us by calling in and supporting a young man like Curtis. You're at a place like the Dream Center where 700 people live here every single day. You start to see some incredible things start to happen. You start to see the light go on in people's hearts and faith and belief be restored in their soul. But it starts with brokenness. It usually starts with pain and despair. And when they come into this program, oftentimes with nothing left, but a desire to just have a safe place to settle and to rebuild their life. That's what we have seen happen at the Dream Center every single day in this 15-story hospital. And right now, I'm in the floor of the Women's Discipleship Program, a one-year recovery program where lives are being transformed every single day by the power of God's love and the power of God's Word. Will you pray for these ladies? Will you pray for these incredible women whose lives are being rebuilt every single day. Women like Camille. In all the years I've been at the Dream Center, over 23 years, I've never heard of a story of transformation more incredible than Camille. She came into this program and her background is very similar to like many of us, raised in a Christian home, doing the best that she could, not without the struggles of life that we all go through, until one day something happened in her life that was unimaginable, something that broke her heart that was meant to try to destroy her, but now she's here at the Dream Center. And I want you to hear the incredible testimony of Camille. I was born into a Christian home. I had great parents. So I wanted to go to Texas Southern University and my parents wanted me to go to Texas Christian University. I didn't want to go. I said, okay, I'm going to find a way out of this. I went to a recruiting station and I talked to all the recruiters and I was just like, you know what, I'm going to go Navy. I ended up dating a guy and just ended up falling in love with each other. He wanted me to get pregnant. I couldn't get pregnant. Our relationship started going down and we ended up breaking up, called off the wedding and everything. One day I was at work and I found out I was pregnant. There was nothing nobody could do to tell me that I shouldn't have an abortion. My mind was set. When my mind is set on something, it's set. I didn't care about the baby, I didn't care nothing. And then there came the ultrasound. And the minute that, I, that they showed me the baby and they showed me the heartbeat, I was told them I couldn't do it. And I left and I didn't drink, I didn't do anything and I just got back in my word and I was praying that this baby would make it and everything, not for my benefit, but for my daughter's benefit. So the day that I went into labor, I called him and called him and called him and finally he picked up and he told me to stop calling him. He was in North Carolina with his girlfriend and her daughter and he was spending time with her and he didn't have time for it. After that, I just said that no matter what, I'm gonna be there for her. So I had her by myself. First cry, I mean, meant everything to me. And when they asked me what did I want to name her, I just, it's something just said, Kennedy. So I named her Kennedy. After the paternity test, and she was proven to be his, um, he would want to come see her every once in a while. So when he saw her, I was always there. And her dad said, well, can I see her? Can you just trust her with me for a night? And I was like, okay, you can have her for a night. I got a phone call February 7th at 2.18 in the morning to come to the hospital. And I checked in. He asked if I was Kennedy Brown's mother, and I said, yes, can I see her? And he asked me to wait. 
and he brought in two other men in the room. That's when he told me my daughter died. My daughter was dead. Um, that sudden instant, I felt life taken away from me. I felt like my life was just gone. It was ripped apart from me. And then they asked me to look at my daughter to make sure that was her. So I walk in this room, nothing's beeping. You just see her laying in bed, and she was so lifeless. I laid next to her, and she loved to hear me sing, and I just sang to her, just thinking she would get up, because I didn't want her to be dead. And right before we found out it was going to be a murder trial, her dad confessed that his girlfriend told him that she couldn't deal with her daughter and my baby crying. So she just put the pillow over her face just so she can get her to quiet. She put the pillow over her face just so she can get her to quiet down for a little bit. I did my best to protect her and I didn't mean for none of this to happen. That very moment, I, I hated God. I hated everything he stood for. I hated everybody. I hated myself. Cocaine was the only thing that I loved at that moment. I started dancing just to look for attention and to get her off my mind. It was not one minute that I was sober. About four weeks after she died, I, I ended up going to the psych ward and I tried to hang myself. First time I was literally hanging and they brought me down and he said that I was screaming so hard for them just to let me hang. So then after that, I just, I tried everything. I tried to overdose on ecstasy pills, Xanax, cocaine, and I, I, they just, I just couldn't. Nothing, nothing ever happened. My parents were trying to help me and trying to take care of me, but I wouldn't have it. One day, I, uh, my mom was like, no, please, you need help, you know? Somebody came and spoke about the Dream Center, and I was like, oh, no. No, oh, ma'am, that sounds like a nightmare. I'm not going there. I did an interview on the phone, and but I was like, I'm not going, but okay, I'll do an interview. And I told him, I said, well, I mean, it's really no help because I don't believe in God. I just don't. You know, they just kept pursuing, pursuing. My sister put in my application, and they asked if I made a decision on what I wanted to do. And they told us that I could come here February 11th, which is my dad's birthday. And something just clicked and said, that would be one of the best birthday presents you can give to your dad. It's crazy because like, I, I, I truly honestly believe there was no God. And I did not raise my hand in praise and worship. One day I just, I just lifted my hands. I just felt so weak and I just fell to my knees and I just started worshiping God. And I knew it was God talking to me and he's given me so much hope. Now I don't have to be ashamed of what I've done. Now I know my daughter's like proud of me. Like I felt like there was no hope for me. And Pastor Matthew made his, turned his dream into reality which gave me back reality. I was so dead and now I'm alive. Like I can feel again, like I'm not numb anymore. And my biggest fear was facing my child's death and I'm doing it. Before I came here, 
I didn't care about anybody else's problems. I never wanted to help. I never thought anybody went through what I went through. And my mom used to say, you could turn this into good and just, just help somebody. And I didn't want to. I couldn't even help myself. I didn't care. I didn't want to hear about it. But coming here, that's all you want to, all I want to do is help somebody. There's somebody out there worse than me that feel like there is no hope. And my dream from being here is to help a childless mother. No matter how they lost their child, although they feel like they can't get help, although they feel like there is no hope and no God, I just want to help them and let them know there is hope. There is a God. And you're not alone when you go through this. And I've forgiven her. I know, like I said, I know there's steps, but I've forgiven her. It does not get easier. I can honest, I can be honest with you. It's never easier. But I'm turning yesterday's pain into tomorrow's peace. Our God is that great. He can take us out of pain and put us into a place where we can make a difference. He can use something that have led us down a rough patch in life and turn it into something great. He knows our hearts. He knows our past. But he doesn't judge us on any of that. Instead, he takes all those things and uses them for his glory. He made a shepherd into a king, a peasant into the mother of the Messiah. So remember, no matter what mistakes you've made or how awful your life has been, God can redeem you. He can give you a passion for Him and a purpose in life. You help make it possible 24 hours, seven days a week. Please consider partnering with the Dream Center, becoming a dedicated supporter of this organization that's changing lives and restoring the broken. In fact, we'd love to invite you right here on this campus and see what your investment is all about. And if you give a gift today of $50 or more, I will send you my book, God's Dream for You as a permanent thankful reminder of how much we appreciate all that you do. Thank you for watching and join us next week for another powerful story of hope and transformation. You'll continue once again to see how your support impacts the lives of so many people. Come see what God is doing right here at the Dream Center.